Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity. I uh, suggested actually this uh, meeting some months ago before the pandemic, because as your mayor, I wanted uh, the opportunity to uh, sit with you or stand in whatever way um, to have an informal conversation about how I saw and see your very, very important role and about the substantive issues which you and many members of the public have raised tonight. I would like, if I may, take five or 10 minutes. Might take a little longer. I will try not to uh, take any longer than I have to. And I, I want to do four things, I suppose. Number one, I want to describe to you the history of Measure U and where we're at from my perspective. I would like the opportunity to be able to describe to you how as mayor of this city, uh, I see as one leader, your very, very important role. I want to agree with uh, a number of your fundamental premises and principles, and I want to strongly disagree with some of the conclusions that you have rendered here uh, this evening. And maybe I can begin here uh, with the substance. It might surprise you for uh, you to hear directly from me as your mayor that I believe you are absolutely correct that the system is stacked against the neighborhoods the system is stacked against the young people. The system is stacked against inclusive economic development. The system is stacked in favor of public safety. The system has been stacked in favor of public safety actually for a long, long time. It's actually why I ran for mayor after a pretty proud progressive history, I know when I was a younger man, as a city council member, as a legislator for 14 years, as the president of the state senate, and as the author of the only millionaire's tax in the country, Proposition 63, the Mental Health Services Act, which does generate currently $2.4 billion a year for mental health services. And I came back after serving in one of the highest positions in the state government because one, I love my city, and two, my whole life and my whole career has been about fighting for the same things I know you, Dr. Kofer, and the other members of this committee spend your lives fighting for. And so I got into office and I saw that, depending upon how you look at it, 75 to 80% of the city budget was and is in fact dedicated to public safety. Now we can break that down and I think it is important at some point that we do break that down, not to make excuses, but to just understand the reason for that. Whether it's binding labor arbitration whether it is the long history of how municipal government has seen its, its role, mainly as a, as a distributor, if you will, of quote, essential services, which have always been defined traditionally as police and fire, throw in a little parks and library, maybe a summer rec program or two, I'm being a little bit pejorative here, but you'll excuse me, because it's actually true. And then of course we pick up the garbage and we provide the basic utilities. That's what a city has traditionally done. Now, I don't expect the people who've commented tonight or any of you, frankly, to necessarily believe me, but I'm gonna tell you my truth tonight. I ran for this office after my long career of public service because I wanted to see a city 
and still wants to see a city that defines its core responsibility as more than just providing those traditionally traditional basic services. That it would be a city for and about young people. That it would be a city that would tackle homelessness because when I look at mental health, homelessness is the most visible manifestation of untreated mental illness. And yet it persists and has grown, not just in Sacramento, but in our state and in our country. And I ran on a very clear platform. Continue the growth of Sacramento, because I think that growth, that vitality is good. But it's only meaningful if it is inclusive and tied to the neighborhoods, and especially the young people in our neighborhoods. And third, even though we're not a health and human services agency, there's no Measure U committee, by the way, down the street at the County Board of Supervisors, um, homelessness is in fact a city responsibility as well because these are our neighbors and these are our residents as well. I ran on that platform. And in 2018, as I saw the Measure U, original Measure U, which by the way, predates me and was by definition dedicated that first whatever it was 40 plus million 45 growing to 50 million dollars dedicated to public safety and again throw in a little parks here and this or that but really it was public safety and we all know it and in fact the advocates back then felt that they were promised more and and not and never delivered i inherit that first 50 million now the easy thing for me to do as mayor of this city would have been actually to go along with the public safety unions and to say, let's just renew the half cent. We're coming out of the recession. And then it would have been business as usual. And me as a relatively new mayor would not have had the tools to do exactly what you're talking about and what I ran for office to do. So I took a big risk and I asked my colleagues and they, some reluctantly, some not so reluctantly, agreed to add the second half cent and to campaign for a full cent. And you are absolutely right. I campaigned on a message of inclusivity and investing that second half cent, at least as much of it as possible, in what we have now defined in our community as inclusive economic development. And that means a wide array of investments from workforce development, youth, affordable housing and homelessness, helping our, our distressed businesses, especially in our diverse commercial corridors throughout the state, excuse me, through, throughout the city. But I also said at the time, if you go back and look at all my, my words, that we had a bit of a Hobson's choice that we had to make because I wanted to do this as a specific tax. To, to bind my colleagues and frankly, the city family to spend the money on inclusive economic development. To do so would have required a two thirds vote. And so I made yes, a political calculation, but I did it openly that in order to pass this and at least have a chance, we would need to do it as a majority vote. And that meant taking a risk, the very risk we're talking about here tonight, that if it passed, I could not guarantee, really guarantee you or the people of Sacramento that it would be all spent or even primarily spent on inclusive economic development. And so what happened? In 2018, we won the election as predicted with 57% of the vote. We didn't get to the two thirds vote threshold. So fast forward then to my state of the city address uh, at the Pinnell Community Center in Meadowview in February of 2019, where if you know that old saying, victory has a thousand mothers and fathers, the minute we won all of a sudden, police and fire, the folks that have gotten the lion's share of the money, all of a sudden said, well, it's our money too. Now, what did I do? Did I acquiesce as the mayor? Did I say, all right, well, you guys are strong and tough. By the way, they didn't support me in my 
election to become mayor of this city, if that's a, a relevant fact at all. I'm not sure it is. I try to work with everybody, and I do work with them. I respect the role that they play in our community and, and, and uh, the important work that they, that they do. But did I acquiesce? No. I actually engaged, and I know my colleague, Councilmember Schneer, is back here, and he was on my side actually engaged in a pretty bloody fight here, sitting on the other side of that dais with a couple of my colleagues sitting around here because they wanted to forget the promises I had made that you are properly holding me to account to. And they wanted to say, well, we've got long-term pension problems. We've got to put more of this money away. We need to put it in the general fund. So what happened? June, 2019. I convinced my colleagues, with a little help from uh, uh, especially a couple of my colleagues, to pass a resolution that said the city would spend 40 out of the $50 million, representing the second half cent, 40 out of the $50 million, for at least for the next five years, on inclusive economic development. Now, you could criticize me, and I will take that criticism. Why didn't you go for all 50 out of 50? And the honest answer is because I could not prevail to get 50 out of 50. I got 80%. And then what I couldn't because the counter pressures from many places, including my colleagues, including within the city here, allowed me to get not half a loaf, but 80% of a loaf. And so then what happened, and this is where I really want to fundamentally disagree with your conclusions and have this dialogue straight up among, uh, among friends and people who care, I know, as much about our community as I do. Because you claim that none of this money went to the promises made. And I want to show you without any sleight of hand, but by the numbers, that if one year's worth of the second half of Measure U is $50 million, which is about what it is, and it is about a year and a half, give, give, go from, give me the benefit of that and go from January 1st of 2019 with the November election, it's been about a year and a half since Measure U passed that we have actually spent and or committed nearly $70 million on inclusive economic development. And I'm gonna walk you through that. So to stand here and sit here and to tell a story that all the money's going to the cops and we have forgotten our promises, I would respectfully say to you, it's just plain not true. And I'd like to walk through it, please. And it's a little bit tortured, but it's important that we go through this. So first of all, after Measure U passed, I immediately convinced my colleagues to, and it was controversial, to put $16 million into homelessness so that we could aggressively pursue the Capitol Park Hotel, the, uh, the shelter off of, uh, Railroad Avenue and begin to uh, lay the foundation for the other homeless shelter and intervention projects that we uh, so desperately need in our community, $16 million. In addition, in calendar year 2019, we spent $12.258 million on youth and neighborhoods. And here are some of the categories. Youth pop-ups, we've put $2.6 million into. The Simmons Center, $350,000. St. John's Shelter for Women and Children, $700,000. City of Refuge, $300,000. Roberts Family Resource Center, two hundred. dollars Advanced Peace. Think the police department, by the way, likes Advanced Peace? No, $750 million. The La Familia Center, 350,000. The Del Paso Sports Complex, 1.9 million, 1,000 strong. Paid work experience for Sacramento teenagers, 
$774,000. Summer Night Lights, $600,000. North Area Freedom Schools, one of the most important summer programs for young uh, African-American children in our community, $240,000. Kindergarten to college savings accounts, $150,000. Fair free uh, transit for youth, fought for by uh, Council Member Chenier, $1 million. The Powerhouse Science Center, that doesn't even count because that came from a different place. $12.258 million. Then we did add $10 million permanently to Mr. Jasso's budget, not for police, not for fire, but to actually make sure that we have the ability in the short term, the medium term, in the long term, to be able to support the various economic development initiatives that, uh, th that um, we want to not just do as one-offs or as pilots, but for the long term. We then added seven and a half million dollars a year anticipated debt service for the first of its kind in Sacramento, a hundred million dollar affordable housing bond. Ms. Cresswell, member of your commission knows about those plans as we worked with the housing uh, community very, very closely uh, to, to uh, at least put ourselves in a position where we could do that. That's as a result of the bloody budget fight of early 2019 and June of 2019. And so now let's fast forward because we begin then to say, all right, we now have real time to begin to prepare for the full implementation of Measure U to find again as that 40 out of the $50 million for 2020. What were we planning to do? We have discussed this publicly from the dais. We were planning to let a $100 million housing bond, a $100 million bond for our distressed commercial corridors, inclusive economic development, Franklin Boulevard, Stockton Boulevard, Del Paso Boulevard, Northgate Boulevard, we had all of the plans in place, plus to have an additional 20 to $25 million of direct investment in youth workforce and other inclusive economic development strategies, all ready to go. This is the budget we would have passed a couple of weeks ago, June of 2020. And then COVID hit. I don't have to say to you that I didn't cause that, you didn't cause that. This was a national and international tragedy. Look at how many people have lost their lives. When you look at the documents that Don Holm presented a few moments ago, and you look at that sales tax line, between the second half of this calendar, excuse me, the first half of this calendar year and the next budget year, the anticipated and actual drop in sales tax revenue is about $40 million. That's what it is. And so I cannot, I, I wanna get to a place though where you, where, where I, I again agree with you in a moment, <laughs> but I cannot, do what I promised to in the shortest of short terms because that money, that $40 million is now gone. Now, if anyone doubts the idea that growth is a good thing, at least sustainable growth is a good thing, look at what happened after COVID hit because the difference between our 2018 census population of 508,000 and the 2010 census data, which was in the low 400,000s, the difference to the city of Sacramento is an $89 million plus stimulus check because the Congress drew 
the line at at population 500,000. So we get $89 million. And I immediately, as the mayor, start worrying the heck out of all of the lawyers for the city. Because the law says you have to spend this money on COVID-related expenses. I say I understand. But to me, the people who have suffered the most from COVID are the very people that I committed to helping and the city committed to helping with Measure U. And so I am going to ask for forgiveness, I suppose, rather than permission. And I'm going to say very publicly that I want to find the intersection, and I want to stretch it, between what is COVID-19 related and what is inclusive economic development. So what I said, and in fact, I put it in a, I won't read the entire letter, but I put it in a May 7th, 2020 letter to my colleagues and to the public in which I laid out four categories for how we might spend this money, all, 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 all centered on inclusivity. $20 million for small business, which of course, Amanda Blackwood helped lead that effort. I mean, have really gotten hit as hard as anybody. $20 million for youth and workforce development. $20 million for housing and homelessness. And $20 million for tourism and the creative economy including arts education with an emphasis on our growing diverse cultural economy. And so we have already allocated, at least preliminarily by vote of the council, $34 million of that, hope the lawyers aren't listening again, of that inclusive economic development dollar under COVID. And what have we committed to? I want to give you a little bit of a list because I did not hear it presented around this dais tonight or from any of the community comments. We put a million dollars plus into eliminating the digital divide. We put $2 million into domestic violence intervention. We put 250,000 into family mental health initiatives and 150 into financial literacy and 250 into food insecurity and 250,000 into the Central Labor Council hotline to assist unemployed workers. And we put 150 into rental mediation. And we put 2.25 million working with Jesse Ryan and others on youth enrichment, including hopefully six weeks of intensive academic enrichment for the students who need it most this summer because they've missed so much school. And then there's economic relief to small businesses, which is now up to $11 million. If you read tomorrow's staff report where we're gonna vote on the 10 million, the criteria recommended by Mr. Jasso and his team, which we are clear are, are prepared to fully support, is that at least 75% of that $10 million go to disadvantaged businesses. Now, could that be higher? Please, that's a fair argument, good argument. 75%, it's a pretty good number. So maybe take that $11 million and discount it by 25%. Maybe 25% is not inclusive, but 75% is. $2 million for homelessness, including our first meth detox facility, as well as more investments to St. John's and City a Refuge. We've set aside $5 million for the creative economy and haven't yet determined how we're gonna spend it, but I promise you, it will be centered on inclusivity. 2.1 million of additional resources above what I just mentioned 
for our homeless response plan. We're now up to almost 800 people off the street in Project Room Key with the county, and we need this money to help ensure that we can permanently house them. And oh, sorry I'm re if I'm reading the line correctly. Youth mental health, $1.3 million. And youth training and development, 500,000. And oh, another 2 million on top of what I already mentioned for youth pop-ups. I added up and discounted a little bit. Let's call it 30 million. 30 million plus the nearly 40 million that we spent on the front end of Measure U after it passed for inclusivity is about, and you check the math, you might come a little under, you might come a little over, is about $70 million in a year and a half. Actually pretty close to the exact value of the second half of Measure U. And so, I go back to the essence of this, and then I wanna to mention today, because I don't think it should go unnoticed. Today, I stood uh, just a few feet from here on the other side of the podium here, and I proposed something that I think has the potential to be transformational, not just in policy, but actually in dollars. I propose not only uh, independent review of, of officer-involved shootings, deaths in custody, and any force that results in serious bodily injury to a resident of Sacramento as a result of a police, uh, a police action. I proposed an immediate $5 million investment in establishing a non-law enforcement response to 911 calls that do not involve criminal activity. And more significantly, I propose that we completely phase out the police department over the course of 24 months from ever answering those calls and that we directly shift the money that they are spending in responding to those calls to this new non-law enforcement unit. Now, I don't yet know what that number is, but I know that in the downtown area, 30% of the police calls are homeless related. So that's gonna be 30% of a pretty good base just in the downtown on a, what is it, $170 million budget? And so <clears throat> I wanna conclude and then of course engage in the dialogue with you by first, well, I have one other thing to say, which is that I want to give voice to your frustration and apologize to you on behalf of the city for at best the ambiguity in the role that you are supposed to or not supposed to play. As far as I'm concerned, first of all, you're leaders of the city, so your voice is welcomed and in any way, in any form. You know, I like to say you got the mic, express yourself. But I wanna, uh, uh, there has been some ambiguity here. And so maybe, you know, we got to own some of that. Here's the way I viewed your role. And, may, if it, and I know I met with you in the first meeting or whatever, but it wasn't kind of a conversation like this. The way we viewed this, right or wrong. So you know, I mentioned a moment ago, I put out this letter, May the 7th, right? Putting together these buckets for the stimulus money should be spent. My idea of the Measure U Advisory Committee is that you would hold us accountable for making sure that the dollars we spent on inclusive economic development are actually geared towards measurable outcomes. That was, my, that, that was the idea. Not you would have a, a, a look-see at the various projects to, set, to ask and to, and to opine whether or not they were consistent with any of the objectives, but that you would be bringing us best practices. You would be engaged in intensive evaluation of how we are spending or not spending the money. And you would be telling us consistently whether or not we are missing the mark in terms of, in terms of the overall plan. That was my, that was my 
um, idea and that the investment committee would, would have a first crack at the individual projects themselves. Well, it's all kind of a mishmash now because there isn't a measure U for the, for the, at least the time being until the tax base comes back and then we go right back to where we, excuse me, in, until we were, uh, were, until where we were at. But that was my view of this. In terms of participatory uh, budgeting, I, I love it, actually. The only thing that I have a hard time getting my head and arms around with participatory budgeting is, is the price tag. <laughs> In some ways, ironically, because of the very things that we're talking about here today, how do we invest more in the programs that um, are so desperately needed for people. We're having the same discussion and debate around, <clears throat> around um, the, the CARES Act fund because we could spend all the money under and the CARES on rental assistance. We could spend it all on food. And actually that would be rational and justified. But it also wouldn't enable us then to have the ability to invest in workforce development or in youth or in the summer enrichment project. So we are grappling, just as you're grappling, with a variety of choices. I will make this offer to you, and I'm just one vote. I, I am the mayor, but I'm just one vote. If there is a way that you could and would be willing to look at uh, not only my letter, which has been approved now by the city council as the framework for how to spend the $89 million and give us your opinion, guidance, um, suggestions, improvements, but also to look at the specific expenditures that we are proposing to make and haven't yet made because there's still, I think like $55 million $55 million or so left and to help advise us and guide us as one voice, but one very important voice, um, I think that would be incredibly valuable because this money is now our temporary measure you money. Sorry, I, it, that is what it is. It is our temporary measure you money. But if you look at the early investments here, they are actually, they actually track pretty closely to some of what we promised and began delivering on uh, during the Measure U campaign. Thank you for a few moments uh, and uh, I stand ready to talk about anything that um, the committee would like to talk about. 